Hey, this is Byron, and I've got Frankie Waller and Marcy Stamper here with me on Voices of the Met How. Nice to have you here. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. Hey, hello to both of you. We're really looking forward to learning more about uh, Frankie's family history with sheep. That's correct. Well, I know, Frankie, you had mentioned that your family uh, ended up with 20 so-called bummer sheep that had been rejected by their mother. So I was just wondering, okay, you know, how that okay. came to happen. Were you were they looking for sheep to raise, or were they helping someone out? Uh, well, I will just begin by saying my mother started uh, us in the sheep business. Uh, a okay. sheep man who had several bands of sheep. His name was Mr. Albert Treber, and he was from the Okanagan uh, area. He gave her about 20 bummer lambs. I told you that the bummer lambs had lost their mother at birth, or sometimes the mothers would have twins and not accept one of them. So, uh, Mr. Uh, there were other uh, sheep men in the Okanagan area, and that's where Mr. Treber was. And uh, they, there was a Mr. Lasamis and Parm Dixon, and they would go up in the Okanagan area uh, when Dad finally got his bands of sheep together. He would go into the Satan area. So that's kind of, and occasionally a, a sheep would get mixed up, and they would just say, oh, I found one of your sheep, come get it. And so they would exchange these uh, that had left their band and gone to another one. When Mother did that, uh, I was before school age, and uh, we had a big front porch and I would sit on the porch and mom had uh, well it, to me there were pop bottles uh, with a nipple on the end of them and these when mom came out of course they came running and there were about 20 of these lambs uh, she would feed all of them with on with the bottle and so they grew, and then finally they were put out into the fields to eat some of the weeds and stuff like that uh, after got, they got big enough. Dad decided he would get into the sheep business. Uh, so I'm not quite sure about this date, but either 1936 or 1937, uh, Dad bought additional ewes, and they were in business. It took a couple of years to increase the uh, number of sheep so that Dad could be a member of the Washington State Wool Growers Association. You had to have at least 10,000 sheep, is my understanding, if I remember correctly. He had two bands uh, uh, with a herder and two sheep dogs and a camp tent, what they called a camp tender. This person was the cook and packed up the camp when they moved to a different area to feed. This was up in, in, in the uh, mountains, in the Pesaten area. Then in the spring, Dad had what we called the sheep camp. And this was between Aniat and Lincoln Rock, uh, right under Birch, what was called Birch Mountain. Uh, and that's where the ewes were taken uh, to have their baby lambs. Uh, when they came out of the Satan area in the spring, the ewes were taken there so that they would have their babies. Uh, but then they would take some of these uh, sheep to uh, down, um, uh, oh, they would, tr they would bring them down to Robinson Creek. That's probably very <laughs> important. And then they would 
separate them. And uh, they would go uh, out of the Pesaten area, and then they would go to, oh uh, gosh, I want to see my, what it says here, to the Quincy Ephrata area, where Dad leased land from the federal government. Uh, and he and my brother Bob uh, would shear the sheep. They would take the wool uh, and put the wool in big, what we called wool bags, because the price for wool was very low. But when World War II came along, the United States government bought the wool for a good price. And the wool, uh, while in the bag, did not rot or mold, so they could set the bags back. And when the price went up, they would sell them. The sheep, while they were down in that Quincy Freda area, uh, they were driven <laughs> by sheep herders and etc. Bob and Dad. Uh, all the way from that area, the Quincy Freddy area, driven they were driven to Orondo and loaded on a ferry that was built to take the sheep across the river, and the docking place was near Antiat. And then they drove the herd to the sheep camp below Birch Mountain by horseback down the road till they got to the sheep camp. Uh, they got them down to the lambing camp, and then they would separate them, and then they would take the rest of them on back up that would go into the Satan area, the ones that they weren't going to take to market. And they would take the ones that they planned to go to market and, and load them, uh, well, they would take them by truck to Pateras and load them on a livestock trains and ride the train in the caboose, my brother and my father, uh, to Chicago, where they were taken to market and sold. My brother and my father after all of this took place, the selling of the sheep, came back to Pateras on a passenger train. And Dad would call Mom at home at the ranch to come to get them. This is a kind of an interesting little tidbit I want to put in there. One time I remembered Mom told Dad to not look for the old car as she had bought a new green Chevrolet from the Chevrolet dealership in Twist. Dad was pretty upset and complained to all who would listen. A couple of months later, he bragged to his men friends that Mom had made a good deal. So she got a new car out of <laughs> that. Is there something in there that I have forgotten that, that you can think of? To me, I don't know that you've forgotten anything. I mean, there are so many interesting details that there were a few things I just wanted to follow up on. Um, okay. So it's hard for me to imagine that 10,000 sheep could be managed by, was it just your brother, your father, and one no. herder? And no, dogs? there were there were two bands of sheep kind of in a separated way where well, there was one sheep herder and then there was a, a what I called a camp tender. Uh, he was the one who uh, cooked for the camp and uh, took care of the dogs and that sort of kind of thing that he, he was just there. And I think it's very interesting. These were Basque. They B-A-esque men who were with the sheep. They usually came from Montana. I'm sure that's where Dad got them from, to uh, be with sheep. 
and he had these bands of sheep. He would have two separate bands, uh, and and then they would move to another place for feed, and so then there was one, the cook, I guess you'd call him, uh, would do the back packing up of the camp. I remember that there was a, a wagon, uh, a camp wagon, and uh, that's that that had the cookhouse in it. Uh, I can't say that the men slept there. They probably slept in sleeping bags or something of that sort underneath the camp trailer. And uh, it was pretty rustic for them to do all of those things. They were Basque, and they had each had uh, three three dogs, three or four dogs. I'm not sure whether there was uh, four, three or four dogs with each bunch of sheep. And so the the dogs were very amazingly trained. We called the Basque people the sheep herders. Uh, they would just whistle and. I don't know, <laughs> but the, the dogs knew what that whistle meant. So they would round them up, pull them together, and then move them to another place where they would have fresh uh, feed. Frankie, um, can you explain a little bit about the the, the yearly cycle um, up with the sheep so that they would be in the Basaten at a certain time, and, and then they'd be down in Iniat, um at a certain time. And, and wasn't there another place so- south where they wintered, um, s- south of Wenatchee? Yes. yes. Okay, let's just go back to the springtime. They would be brought down to Robinson Creek. Uh, that's just above Mazama. And uh, then they would be trucked uh, to the Quincy Ephrata area. And that took quite a while. I mean, because, you know, they back and forth and back and forth. However, Dad did uh, uh, hire trucks uh, to carry them. And that was the ones that were going to the Quincy Ephrata area. And he kept the ones that were to go to market there at the ranch. There was, uh, well, there's a pretty big space there. And uh, I'm not sure how many went to market. I, I don't remember that at all. So then they get down to the Quincy Freight area in uh I would say more or less the springtime. Then that was when they would drive them from Quincy Ephrata to Arondo to go across the river on this ferry boat that they went to Anyat, get off the ferry boat. And of course, the ferry boat went back and for several times and then they would they would have several men who would drive the animals after they got to Antioch down to the lambing camp which like I said is close to the Birch Mountain and Lincoln Rock it, it kind of right in there and dad had purchased land there and he kept lots of times mostly the ewes and that's where they shared the sheep right there and they would have (laughs) uh there was a traveling group of people uh, men of course um who uh, went from place to place because I had mentioned earlier that there were these sheep men in the Okanagan and they would come and cheer along with my dad and brother uh, and then that's when they would put the wool in the bags and as I said I guess they decided to wait and store them and I don't know how that happened <laughs> uh, uh, 
in the bags, uh, but they could sell it when World War II came because the government would buy the wool for a good price to, you know, make clothes for the soldiers. Then, after that, the shearing was all done and the animals separated from the ones that were going to be taken to a market, they would drive them with horses and and men on these horses up to Pateras. And the ones that, that were going to be going back up in to the Pesatan area uh, would uh, stay there for a bit uh, and then trucks again would truck them to Robinson Creek and then they would go into the Pesatan area. But when they got to the terrace was when my my dad and brother would uh, load them on to the, they called them livestock trains, and, and, and ride the train, and they would ride in the caboose to Chicago, where they were t- the sheep were taken to market, and there they would be sold. My father never bought me very, uh, only a couple times did he just buy me something, but I wish I had this. He bought, brought me from Chicago one time a brown velvet dress that I just loved. It was gorgeous. And the other time he bought me something was he went to Schaefer's Grocery Store in Winthrop, and we were in there, and he said, well, do you need a new pair of shoes? And I said, oh, I love shoes. Oh, yes, Dad. And he bought me a pair of green slip-on shoes. Wow. <laughs> kind of funny for a man to do. <laughs> but he'd surprise me every once in a while. So when they went with the sheep to Chicago, did they ride in the caboose? Yes. Because it was just a livestock train and there wasn't any place for people That's right. To uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> huh. But I think they were pretty uh, well taken care of on the way back because they took a regular train back to get to Pateras then. You know, you have a lot of details about all the the different places they were in the different seasons, but did you ever, did you go to those places and get to see them? Were you up in the Pesatan or you just knew from what your family told you? Uh, I never went. Uh, any further than Hearts Pass, I did not go clear into the Pesatan. Uh, but they would uh, uh, drive them up from Robinson Creek to uh, Hearts Pass. And um, it was a pretty, pretty, I mean, a very, very, very narrow road <laughs> uh, and rugged, of course. Most of this was before I was school age. So repeat that question that you wanted me to maybe uh-huh. say something about. I was just curious to know, you know, whether you got an opportunity to go in person and, you know, watch any of this. So you said you went to Hearts Pass. Like, were you ever there when they were doing the shearing near NTS? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I need, that's what I needed to tell you. Okay, um, there was a cookhouse at, because Mother cooked uh, for the sheep shears and the fellows who took care of the animals there at Rocky Reach, I call it, area, and also down in the Quincy Efredo area. I got to tell you about that, too. There was a dad made... Uh, a cookhouse, let's put it this way, and it was probably uh, 25 by 10, and at one end there was a curtain where we slept, uh, Mom, Dad, and I, and uh, the other part of it was uh, for the kitchen, and then there was a big table, a big table where the fellows could sit around and eat what mother ever, what she cooked for them 
to feed them. I don't know if you've ever, well, probably not now, uh, because it's probably populated. Um, the Quincy Ephrata area uh, was kind of a dust bowl, <laughs> I should just say that. And I remember very, very vividly my mother, because she was, well, a very good cook, housekeeper, blah, 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 and everything else. She would take the dish rag, we called it, the dish rag, and I don't know how many times a day she would wipe off the dirt on the top of this table, and especially, you know, just when it was time for him to come. But the wind blew down there um, quite a bit <laughs> in the springtime. And then, of course, when they got to uh, the sheep camp, which we called, where they shared the sheep, uh, she, she didn't have the wind. So she still had another building. Oh, I forgot to tell you about this building. It was wood, probably to about five feet. And then there was a canvas uh, cover. That that was the roof, was the, this canvas that I don't, I never did see how they did that, but uh, it was to keep the wind out of, you know, everything that was going on there, uh, the blowing of the dirt. So I guess that's kind of part of what life was back then. <laughs> That was a real family uh, affair there. Uh, everybody was participating with the sheep then, huh? Yes. I had an older sister, and then my brother was next, and then I had another sister, and she was 10 years older than I. So it was kind of like I was an only child. But seven years after I was born, my younger sister was born, and, and we were, you know, the older once my uh, oldest sister was 15 years older than I so they were around they the girls uh, married and 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 a couple times they lived on the ranch with their husbands uh, but my brother and my sister-in-law uh, and she was from Spokane um, he had gone to uh, Gonzaga for one year of schooling, and this was very much later uh, after the the sheep thing was all over with when Dad uh, quit doing that. And um, uh, he met my sister-in-law, and they were married, and they lived in this old house for quite a little while. She she was uh, you know a city girl, but she loved everything about the country. <laughs> and when did they get out of the sheep business? I would say uh, probably forty six or seven. Oh, they were out of the sheep business by nineteen forty eight. Dad just decided to get out of the sheep business, and and he just sold them off. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure he took all of them to Chicago to market or what exactly. Dad always raised cattle, and uh, of course he had to have land and space for them to graze. And uh, also one of the things that <laughs> is interesting, too, is uh, he and my brother <laughs> and this is my sister-in-law telling me this. Uh, they took a apple box and they set it on the hill on the way to going to Moccasin Lake after you get to, to the top. They decided that they were going to uh, take some of the water because there was a creek that used to come down there. And this creek used to go right behind our home, I call it the old house. They fixed it so that that water would run up that hillside into Moccasin Lake. And that meant then he could take the water and make sure that it got 
uh, on all of the land so that the grasses and the alfalfa and everything would would grow. Every time my father made a little bit of money, he would um, buy a new piece of machinery or another piece of land. He didn't buy a lot of land all at once. He didn't have the money. And um, he was the president of the Production Credit Association, and that was in the 40s. And that was a group of ranchers and farmers and i can't say just in okanagan county it 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 was an area of which include the meadow valley and the okanagan valley and and over to cooley dam and and things like this so what they used to do was they would put x amount of dollars into this pot and uh Anyone who needed uh, the money could borrow it with um, some interest. Usually, my father would borrow, okay, let's just say October. The winter was coming on anyway. He would borrow enough to live on until it got back to that time. Then he would pay back after maybe selling cattle or sheep or or whatever he had to sell. He also, we used to have pigs too, but not a huge number of them. And that's how uh, these farmers and ranchers kind of lived. <laughs> what I'm trying to say, there was nobody slacking, paying the money back and any of that kind of stuff. It was an organization called the Production Credit Association, of which he was the president at one time. I think the offices were in the OMAC Okanagan area. Pretty impressive that they had that to help everybody. It did. Yeah, it was. It was. And it helped everybody out. Uh, I know it went as far as Cooley Dam. I don't know whether it went any further that way or not, but it went up to Oroville and to Nascot and, and the Madhau Valley. And it, it allowed people to borrow. And of course, they knew they had to pay it back after the time of the year. It, it didn't ever seem like anyone did not do their share. You were saying your family very rarely ate lamb or beef. And did they ever get involved in like spinning wool from their fleece or doing anything with that, or it was all to be sold? That was all to be sold, yeah. Um, we did not eat uh, the beef or the lamb unless, you know, sometimes uh, a sheep would break its leg and Dad would, <laughs> you know, we would have that for a while. He built the present house we i call it the block house it's near uh the road on the way to patterson lake and he built that in 1941 there was a kitchen and a, a dining area there was also what we call the office where dad had his business and a roll top desk and where he would take a nap this is amazing to me too he would eat lunch. Mother would have it ready when he got in there, which was usually right at noon. And he would lay down and he'd sleep 25 minutes. And then when the 25 minutes was up, he was awake and outside irrigating or other things. Uh, there was, there used to be, and I, I understand that it's not there any longer. He also put a cooler where you would put oh apples and vegetables and uh, the milk. No, <laughs> uh, oh, that's kind of a story too. The milk, and then just as after, when you got in there, there was another room that was called what we called was the locker. Well, that's where you put the things to freeze, 
and mother always had a big garden and chickens and things like that and uh, those were the things that were frozen in this this other room and there was a uh, another bedroom and a bathroom down there and three storage rooms and then you went upstairs and the upstairs there was another kitchen another dining room and the living room and I remember so vividly these windows and I, I hope they're still there uh, that were big uh, white they were probably five feet long and eight feet wide, maybe 10 feet wide. One looking down the, I would say, uh, two twin lakes and that sort of thing. You couldn't see twin lakes because it's down in that hole, but it was down that way. He wanted it so he could sit there, <laughs> maybe in the wintertime, I don't know, but anyway, and, and look out down the way to twin lakes. Dad was very inventive. He started in making these pillars. I called them rock pillars because he would take the rock and build a pillar. And, oh, sometimes he would put a light. He could even fix, you know, so uh, electricity off somewhere. I don't know where it came from and use that and they there were several of them there and now they have taken them away and and done some of their own but i still think that his rock work uh is still along the edge of the what used to be the driveway but it's not the driveway now but uh the edge of the lawn Mother always put uh, uh, flowers and vegetables in her garden. She would put the flowers in the garden. She didn't have time to tend flowers, <laughs> you know, that might be, you know, around the edge of the house or something or other. Mother was 98 years old when she passed away, and Dad was 95. They built a home where the sheep camp was that's uh, pretty close to Rocky Reach Dam uh, there on below Birch Mountain and they lived there for quite a number of years. They went to retirement home, well dad did, I would say probably a, more of a nursing home uh, for about the last year of his life. Mother, she had a sister. Uh, <laughs> you need to, I need to tell you about my two aunts someday. They went to uh, a retirement home in uh, East Wenatchee, and they lived there for quite some time, uh, enjoying life. That's <laughs> what they did. I have to say again how my father really used his brain <laughs> to do all of those things, you know. It's, uh, and I think that that we, when we lived here, of course, I was born and raised out at the ranch. And uh, I think everybody was kind of like that. Everybody helped everybody out, and everybody went out and got a deer for, meat <laughs> if they had cattle or sheep or, or pigs or whatever they had uh, they didn't slaughter them for food they you know they were to be sold so it, it, it's very interesting these older people and they're and they're they're getting less and less of us now but uh, they were very inventive such a different way of life, it seems. Yeah, very much so. So thanks, Frankie, for sharing your memories with us. Well, and thank you for asking about it. Now I have the bug, and I'm going to write this book, and I'm going to call it Life in the Meadow. <laughs> yes, you have.
have my thanks also. It's so interesting hearing all your stories. And uh-huh. we'll just look forward to talking the next time. Yes, and uh, um, I will start working on the book, and I'd love to tell you about my two aunts. <laughs> And we will talk again when you find it a good time to do so. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you, Frankie. Really appreciate this. Mm-hmm.